Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR, HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR, HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. And welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. This is a place of inspiration, education, and hope for a more compassionate and sustainable world. I offer this educational and inspirational show to you freely, but want you to know that your support really makes a difference. Please consider making a donation to support this program, which you can do right on the TeresaNicasio.com website, and where there's also information about advertising and sponsorship opportunities as well. Uh, feel free to message me through the contact form on my website, and that's TeresaNicasio.com, Teresa with an H, Nicasio with an N like Nancy, and two S's. So that's T H E R E S A. N-I-C-A-S-S-I-O. Or you can contact me directly by email at Teresa at TeresaNicasio.com. Anyway, um, be sure to join us next week when naturopath Dr. Jessica Renfer will be joining us to talk about detoxing your body and how you can do so through safe and natural ways. And then followed um, the next week, uh, we're going to have Marco Aguiar, who's going to be talking about mindful vacationing and how vacationing, I love this, uh, can be a powerful tool for personal transformation and discovery. And so we need an excuse, but it's going to be really a great show, too. For today's show, it is live um, if you're, if you're uh, listening right now as it's airing initially. So feel free to phone in during the program if you have any questions for today's guest. If you do call in, just let our producer, Jay, know what your question is so that he can pass it along to us during the break. And if we can, we will answer your question right on the air. For those of you in the U.S., you can call in toll-free at 800-555-5453. And if you're outside of the U.S., the number is 310-371-5444. Those numbers are on my TeresaNicasio.com website as well for your reference. All right, folks, this is a very special day. Uh, Even though we've never met in person before, today's guest has personally touched my own life, as I know that he has also made a difference in many of yours as well. With us today is Dr. Alessio Fazzano, the leading expert of celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity in the world. Dr. Fazzano serves in many ways, including as a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and as the chief of the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition at Mass General Hospital for Children. His courage to address a blind spot in the medical field and to fiercely advocate for a subset of the population who were mysteriously suffering energized Dr. Fasano's passion for his visionary research. His work that established the rate of celiac disease at that time to be one in 133 people led to the awareness of celiac disease as a growing public health problem in the United States. Dr. Fasano founded the Center for Celiac Research and Treatment in 1996, where he treats adults and children for gluten-related disorders. Dr. Fasano is passionate, and I love that he's a passionate advocate for collaboration in research and clinical work, doing amazing work, and has recently authored a book called Gluten Freedom that's a practical resource for patients, healthcare providers, and general readers um, offering accurate evidence-based information about gluten and how it can affect your health. Dr. Fasano is widely sought after as an expert in celiac disease, intestinal permeability, you probably know it as leaky gut, and autoimmune disorders, and has been featured in media outlets around the world, including National Public Radio, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, Daily Mail, L, Time, and all kinds of other online and media outlets. And now we are privileged that Dr. Fazano is here with us today to talk about um, the kind of what's the most cutting-edge information about gluten, immunity, and the gut. Alessio, welcome to the show, and thank you so, so much for joining us. 
Thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, this is really wonderful. And, and you know, what I like to do, Alessia, with everyone who comes on the show is, is really kind of talk about the why and where, where the passion comes from because it doesn't come from a vacuum. And so I'm wondering if we could start, if you'd be willing to start with sharing a little bit about where your passion uh, for gluten research came from. Uh, you know, there's got to be a story there. Oh, sure it is. Uh, it's it's, um, it's uh, a journey of wisdom uh, and serendipity, if you wish. Um, and again, it is fueled by intellectual curiosity. When I moved to the United States in the early 90s, there was a, a, a you know, movement, if you wish, in Europe in which celiac disease was really rampaging as a, an epidemic. Mm-hmm. And yet, um, when I moved to the United States, it was pretty much unrecognized. And actually, I should say North America, because Canada was the same story. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and the pieces of the puzzle to understand uh, what CD this is all about were coming together. It was pretty obvious at that point that you have to be genetically predisposed and um, exposed to gluten as the two elements that at that time seemed to be necessary, sufficient to develop disease. Mm-hmm. And, and, and again, when I moved here in the United States, it was really, um, you know, definitely. Uh, at odds, the fact that despite these two, two elements that exist in North America, um, the disease was pretty much non-existent here, while, again, in, in, in Europe was really becoming more and more clear that was really on uh, a verge of uh, an increase over time that took epidemic, you know, proportion. And that's really, you know, instigated my intellectual curiosity. Why, why this difference? Why mm-hmm. we have such a dichotomy? Um, you know, when, uh, you know, s- supposedly the key elements are coexisting here as well, but we don't have the disease. Mm-hmm. Oh, we didn't seem to have the disease, so you just got really curious about that. That's right. So, uh, and again, it turns to be that it was a matter of, uh, you know, definition. You know, at that time, uh, the disease was defined as a pediatric condition with symptoms. They are mainly uh, gastrointestinal with these kids with big belly and, you know, um, mm-hmm. um, diarrhea, feel the drive and weight loss and that kind of stuff. And, and again, and truly, a picture like this was not existent at that time in the United States and in Canada. So, you know, the, the statement that this did not exist, if that was the definition, was, you know, accurate. The question being, though, that, again, at that time in Europe, we realized that this was the tip of, of an iceberg in a much more complex way that the disease can present itself. Mm-hmm. And over the years, we learned that no sex, no age, no tissue, mm-hmm. no organ in our body are spared by this condition. So we're dealing really with a clinical chameleon. And when you look at the entire picture, and, and that's what we did, um, we realized that the size of the iceberg in Europe is exactly the same as that in North America. What was the difference, again, is that the disease presented itself in such a different way here compared mm-hmm. to Europe that was, you know, overlooked. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, I think we still are on the tip of the iceberg, and, um, you know, thanks, thank you to you to, for helping us here in North America get a little bit, at least know that there is an iceberg. Uh, that's the that's first right. step. Um, and, you know, as we, you and I were chatting briefly before the show, there's so much we could talk about. I mean, we could literally have probably weeks of, of the show. Um, but, so, you know, we're going to hit some of, the, some of the big things. And you're alluding just now to some of the... The different ways that it expresses itself. As much as it's in the media and as much as I think there's a lot of information getting out there, I think that a lot of people still, I mean, I get this all the time, uh, are still under the impression that uh, gluten just is about gut problems, you know, getting gas and, you know, diarrhea, constipation. It's, but it's all gut pain. It's all about the gut. But you, you like to talk about Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't know if you know, I used to live in Las Vegas, so I get an extra kick out of that. But, um, can, you know, talk a little bit about that, you know, the Las Vegas so, metaphor that you have. <laughs> so, you know, again, the misconception, has been based on the fact that because the encounter between the enemy, i.e. gluten, and the immune system that creates inflammation that leads to the damage of the intestine is on the battlefield, so the intestine, and because the autoimmune insult is the intestine, we had this misconception that the only way that the disease can present itself is through gastrointestinal symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, this is a misconception that, you know, that's not just pertain to serious disease, but many other conditions in which, you know, the, the, the storm comes through the GI door 
but uh, spread in any other place of our body. And, and, and CDC is not an exception to this concept. So that's where, you know, this concept that, you know, the gut is not like Las Vegas, what happened the gut does not stay there, uh, mm -hmm. come from. Because, you know, <laughs> when the ace enemies will eventually make the journey to this loss of body function, leaky gut, if you wish, um, and come in our body, we have an army, literally an army, uh, that will go after these enemies, and these are the immune cells. And when they see the enemy, of course, they use weapons and the collateral damage when you engage in a fight, it's, it's inflammation. Now, mm -hmm. if these soldiers will stay on the battlefield, that inflammation, of course, will happen there, and eventually you develop GI symptoms. Mm -hmm. But we know too well that, again, as I was mentioned before, in serious disease, there are no tissue organs that are spared, meaning that these uh, soldiers, when they are armed, Eventually, you can leave the battlefield. They can go to the skin, and you develop dermatitis, circuit deformities. Can go to the, you know, join, and you can develop, you know, joint pain or swelling or, you know, arthritis. Can go to the brain, and can do so many things to the brain of these individuals with neuroinflammation that can go from mild change in behavior all the way to schizophrenia. And I can go on and on and on. So it should not be a surprise that. <clears throat> even if the encounter and the original fight is on the battlefield of the gut, this can be spread, spread everywhere in the body. Yes. Well, this is huge, and, and, and I think I, I share it in the book, and, and I thank you again for being an endorser for my book. That was a, a real gift. But in the book I talk about how basically I had, I had migraines my entire life, and it wasn't until I was 45 um, that I discovered that they were optional, that they were, it, was, it was gluten that was triggering them all my entire life. And so, you know, it, I, but, you know, you take these things for granted. You just assume this is life, right? Some people get headaches, right. some people don't. Some people get schizophrenia, some people don't. Some people have uh, ADHD or autism, and some people aren't. And, and, and it's not that there's, I don't think that gluten is, and I don't think you do either, that it's the only cause of different things. But can you talk a little bit about if we can just kind of take a couple steps back about, you know, what this thing gluten is. And, and let's, let's, instead of talking, because when we talk about celiac disease, um, which, is, you know, you talk, I know you talk about how we can actually develop celiac disease, I think, even perhaps even without the, I'm not sure if we can, uh, if we can ask the question, uh, without this genetic predisposition. But if we can start with gluten and its behavior in a human body that, as far as we know, is healthy, and maybe bring in the whole concept of zonulin into the into the picture, because this is something that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. <clears throat> That's right. So um, gluten is a protein. Actually, it's a mixture of proteins uh, coming from different grains, including wheat, rye, and barley. It is the largest protein component, actually, of these grains. And, you know, provide some uh, very specific uh, characteristics uh, to these grains, particularly elasticity when they're mixed with water and yeast. And that's the reason why you can do with wheat stuff mm -hmm. that you can do, you cannot do with rice or maize, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, bread and, and the pizza and, and uh, the pasta and so on and so forth. Um, like any proteins, you know, um, gluten can be considered as a sort of pearl necklace. Each pearl has this single component protein that we call amino acid. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And in order to make use of any protein that we ingest with the diet, the first thing that we need to do is to break this per pearl necklace in pieces mm -hmm. that we call peptides. And then eventually peel off one pearl at a time, i.e. amino acids, so that we can absorb them. And the destiny of these amino acids, when they are absorbed, they, they can either be used to generate energy, so they are burned to have energy produced, or they can be remounted based on our genetic, you know, program uh, for, to make proteins of our own body. Mm -hmm. um, now, what is peculiar about gluten is it's the only, um, you know, dietary protein that we cannot completely digest. So we don't have the scissors, so to speak, to cut this in the small pieces and then peel off the single amino acid as we do with other proteins. And this is probably due to the fact that, evolutionarily speaking, we are not destined to eat gluten. They came into the picture only recently, only 10,000 years ago of our 2 million years plus of journey of evolution on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we don't have digestive enzymes that can really completely digest in a gluten. 
Mm-hmm. And um, some of these undigested f- fragments of gluten, um, they have some interesting, you know, properties. Um, and, and again, um, are seen by our surveillance system, particularly the immune system, as possible danger enemies that are attacking our body. And matter of fact, the more we study these fragments, the more we realize that they are perceived by our immune surveillance as fragments of microorganisms that can arm us. And therefore, the immune system unleashes the same weaponry that we, we do when we are under attack of a microorganism that can infect us. Mm-hmm. One of these fragments is capable to communicate with the cell that lying on the surface of the intestine to release this molecule that you mentioned, that it's called zonulin, that has the capability to modulate the permeability of the gut. So imagine, uh, you know, the gut with this single layer of cells, like a sort of wall around the uh, castle or medieval city, so that you are protected against the enemy, but you have to find a way to have merchandise and friends to go in and out. Mm-hmm. So we have a sort of uh, levee bridges that we pull down when we have the needs to have stuff to go out from our body into the intestine or vice versa to come in from our intestine and our body. Mm-hmm. But the system is made so that these levee bridges are most of the time closed mm-hmm. and open only for a short period of time. That's what is the job that zoning does. It opens up this, uh, you know, space in between cells to allow this trafficking to occur. Mm-hmm. The problem arises if these gates are stuck open and not closed immediately and you go back to the power of the medieval city. Now you don't have protection anymore. And stuff mm-hmm. can come in all the time. Mm-hmm. So, so gluten, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, has this peculiarity that has fragments that can communicate to the cell to is to get a release of zone and therefore to make the intestine leakier. Mm-hmm. Now, this machinery is operative in all of us, but there's a huge difference between the vast majority of people in which they turn on and off the system very quickly when they're exposed to gluten, while there are others, like the ones that suffer gluten release disorder, particularly seated disease, in which these gates, they come down and they got stuck open for a long time. Mm-hmm. So long that now there is a permissive <coughs> entrance of this enemies, including gluten, that eventually now are seen by the, our immune system and on a specific genetic background, uh, yes, you need to be genetically predisposed to develop severe disease, you may eventually lose tolerance to this molecule as we technically define, you know, the fact that now we are not able to tolerate gluten anymore and then eventually leads to this attack to your intestine that, you know, uh, eventually cause the clinical outcome that we call seated disease. Mm-hmm. So it almost sounds like in some situations where there there's not the, you're saying if, if there's not the genetic predisposition that uh, there can be a development of a of gluten intolerance or gluten sensitivity, but that eventually the immune system can shift in such a way that celiac disease can be um, can be developed. Is that what you're saying? That's right. So in order to, you know, develop seeded disease, there are some factors that need to be present. And mm-hmm. genetic plays a major role. As a matter of fact, you know, it's one of the few um, autoimmune diseases that, for which we know a lot about the genetics. And there are specific genes, particularly of the histocompatibility genes, what we call HLA genes, and that need to be there because otherwise the immune system can really not see gluten and therefore react to it. Mm-hmm. So uh, these genes, they're called HMADQ2 and the Q8, are a must. Developing CV disease without those genes is almost impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, so therefore, there is a, a strong genetic component. That's not the case for non cv gluten sensitivity. There is no such thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, uh, you know, all this to say that, you know, CV disease is not an exception uh, compared to other autoimmune diseases in which the genetic component is important. And we know this also from family studies. So if, if you are, you know, an, an individual of the general population, you have 1% of the risk to develop celiac disease. But if you are a first degree relative mm-hmm. of, um, of a celiac, you have 10 times more chances. Mm-hmm. And if you are identical twin, you have 70, 75 times more chances to develop celiac disease. Wow. Um, so definitely the genetic is important, but it's not the end of it. As a matter of fact, indeed, 25% are identical twins. They are not concordant. One has the disease, the other one does not. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So genetics and introduction gluten are necessary, but not sufficient. There must be something else that seems to be a play. Mm -hmm. and, and again, this something else are uh, one, loss of barium function. So in other words, you know, this issue of zonulin uh, produces too large amounts that you, you lose the capability to keep, you know, gluten at bay outside of your body. Um, an immune system that is really not able to coordinate well uh, the response when it's in the, under attack of gluten. And finally, last but definitely not least, the composition of the ecosystem in your gut, what we call the microbiome, seems to have a tremendous influence if and when you develop seed disease. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So just out of curiosity with the microbiome, and again, I know that could be a whole show or many, many, many shows in itself. Um, is, does the microbiome have, because some people have talked about having like, uh, with something really quick here, um, fermented products and things like that, uh, fermented grains and, um, and so forth, but can the microbiome be a, uh, a mediator or, or you know, kind of helping to shift or make it so someone is less vulnerable to the gluten or is less likely to have the gut permeability? It seems that that's the case. As a matter of fact, you know, it looks like that it's the macro, it's a certain composition, the microbiome that increase your risk to decrease the zone and to develop CD disease because uh -huh. push your genes to do some stuff and therefore the opposite may probably be true. In other words, there must be some microbiome composition that ameliorate the risk. Okay, great. Well, you know what, Alessio, we need to take a short break. Um, stick around, folks. We're going to be right back with Alessio after the break and hear more about gluten, immunity, and the gut. Um, don't go away. Inspired by a speaker while learning everyday positive information that you can use to help your life is exactly what Dr. Teresa Nicasio does when she speaks in front of your group. From healthcare professionals to special needs parenting and everything in between, Dr. Teresa Nicasio can customize topics for your group on everything from health to psychology. To book Dr. Teresa Nicasio as a speaker for your group, visit yumfoodforliving.com or call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. 6463. For all your live or pre-recorded webcasting needs, come to earthchannel.com. Get your web-based message out to a select group or the whole world. It's easy. A pioneer in webcasting, earthchannel.com provides the best products and services to big corporations and government users. And now, this same technology is available to you. They have the best Earthcast encoders, servers, and products to meet your technical needs. But wait, don't want to mess with technical stress? No problem. They'll do it for you. EarthChannel.com is your answer. You can use webcasting for lots of things like advertising, marketing, customer support, training, and don't forget, web radio and TV. In fact, you're listening to a live Earthcast right now. So come to EarthChannel.com. Actualize your audio or video webcasting needs today. You can't beat the friendly service or the price. Call earthchannel.com at 1-800-849-8978. That's 1-800-849-8978. Yumfoodforliving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit yumfoodforliving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, a blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit yumfoodforliving.com. Yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. If you like to spend your television viewing time learning about some of the things that you may have missed in history class or if history was your favorite subject, then you should check out the link to the History Channel on the HealthyLife.net advertiser page. Order DVD sets by series or by subject matter right from our homepage while you still enjoy your favorite HealthyLife.net show. You're listening to HealthyLife.net, the radio network that brings positive talk with positive change to make your world a little better. Welcome back. 
back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. For those of you who are just joining us, we've been talking with the world's leading celiac disease and non-celiac disease researcher, Dr. Alessio Fazzano. Um, so, Alessio, before the break, um, you know, we started talking a little bit about the microbiome and and how it might be a mediating factor, can be a mediating factor, uh, with regard to um, the expression of celiac disease and, and gluten intolerance, uh, intolerance and um, leaky gut and that kind of thing. Can, can you uh, talk a little bit more about that? Because there's lots to talk about, I know. Yeah, I mean, uh, the technology to understand the complexity of the ecosystem that lives in symbiosis with us from birth to death it really mature in the past few years, and therefore we really start to appreciate that these are not just neighbors that sit there and do nothing. They have a tremendous amount of impact on who we are and how our genetic potentials will translate in the clinical actuality. So, you know, in studying the microbiome, and particularly the microbiome composition in celiac disease has been quite a model for us to study. We learned what was probably until the recent past, unconceivable and unthinkable. The fact that you're born with some genes, for example, to develop breast cancer or Alzheimer or, you know, type 1 diabetes, MS, is not destiny. It's not that you will for sure you will develop the disease. If you do or do not, really depends on the lifestyle um, that eventually impinge upon this, you know, community of uh, microorganisms that in collectively generate 100, 150 times more genes than we do, mm-hmm. and they cross talk with us all the time. And in doing that, can influence if and when and how our genes will go from quiet and dormant to active, and therefore switching from a potential to the actual clinical outcome. Um, so. You know, it is fascinating. This is what we call technically the concept of epigenetics. It's Mm -hmm. it's fascinating that these genes may stay there and not have clinical consequences. And eventually, you know, uh, our lifestyle events that will eventually uh, change the composition, this microbiome, changing diets, uh, traveling, use and abuse of antibiotics, eating uh, stuff that is not really food, may eventually change this very dynamic and by yet finely tuned balance of who lives with us. And now you go from a friendly, you know, neighbor into a belligerent, you know, um, occupant of our guts, Mm -hmm. and this may put you over the edge. And that's the only way that we can explain, for example, how come that, you know, people that are genetically predisposed to celiac disease and hate gluten for decades, they're, they are fine. And then all of a sudden something happens to them and they can develop celiac disease in their 60s or 70s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so confusing. That's, that's a question people have, and and, uh, and and it's part of, I think, what, what fuels the disbelief that it actually is, you know, there's something really there. And, and people go, well, gosh, it's never been a problem before. Um, and uh, and you know I think that we're also seeing some some extreme uh, you know extreme reactions because people trying to figure out what's going on you know so so does it mean you need to have uh, no grains does it mean you need to have you know it's like what uh, people are thrashing around trying to figure out you know what to eat and everybody likes to ask me what they should eat or shouldn't eat and I'm 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 not there I'm not, but I'm wondering you know given your experience if you have any um, uh, nutritional um, re- recommendations given what you know and without and again something I appreciate about you is that you know that you're you're very down to earth and um, not extremist and very um, research grounded but if you have any any just you know, if you're going to talk to your kid or, 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 you know, talk to a mom who has a kid with ADHD or autism or seizure disorders or, or there might be a propensity or um, a genetic risk for psychosis, what, you know, what would you recommend uh, for, say, parents out there? So, again, um, you know, uh, if we want to capitalize on the lesson learned from celiac disease, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and you know, again, uh, the fact that you have the genes is not a destiny, but it's a potential. Uh, of course, we cannot change the genes. We tried actually to edit our genes by doing genetic manipulation, and we failed miserably. Plus, it would be too risky to do that. Mm-hmm. But if there is any way that we can plastically, you know, change if or when these genes will be put at work, 
uh, through the composition of the microbiome, that's a much more feasible, you know, proposition. Now, the question and the challenge, actually, is to understand what kind of composition of microorganisms that live in my guts may eventually touch my, you know, genes and put my predisposition to develop ADHD or schizophrenia or, or, or depression or, you know, um, seizure disorders or psychosis, whatever, mm -hmm. at work so that I develop it. So. We really are in the, let's say, homework kind of stage because when we will learn what is the composition that, of this ecosystem that really put me over the edge and make me developing, you know, um, this kind of condition, then I have a target. Then I can eventually say, okay, if indeed this went wrong and made, you know, this uh, microbiome to cross talk with my genes and, 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 you know, put me now over the edge and develop ADHD, now I know what I can do to rewind the tape, so to speak, and bring me back in business mm -hmm. by changing the microbiome composition change my diet, using probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, whatever, you know, it's possible, and say, okay, I want to go back when we were not in a belligerent relationship and we were in peace so that we can eventually bring these people back. And, and again, it's a very ambitious, um, far from uh, being an actuality, but at least we have, you know, the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, to eventually um, try to find, you know, specific targets to achieve that. That, mm -hmm. again, seems to be, uh, you know, far from, you know, um, actuality, but this is a, a future that is coming, and it's coming fast. Mm -hmm. So I would not be shocked if, indeed, we would be able to recover, you know, and, and bring back to us people that were lost, uh, you know, because of development of these conditions, uh, with, you know, a travesty consequences in their own life and the life of their families. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Is there any, are you, are you or anybody you know uh, involved in research studies? And particularly, I'm really interested, I'm excited about probiotics. That's like one of my, one of my passions and curiosities. And, um, but it, it, it feels a little bit like Russian roulette or, you know, it's like, That's you know, right. which, which of these, you know, uh, strains might be, you know, particularly good for this, that, and the other. Is there, in, are you familiar with any research going on around that? Yeah, I, I, again, uh, ultimately the goal is indeed to find targets. But if we don't know what is missing or has been altered in our microbiome to eventually go for an intervention with specific probiotics, it's like shooting in the dark now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's what it feels like. Okay, That's kombucha right. or, but, you know, but, what is but, it? But, you know, say that, I have to say that targeting the microbiota to make changes that can really be impactful, you know, there are poor concepts. We, together with some colleagues at the University of Texas, and not, not long ago, we published a paper that I believe is very provocative in which we did fecal transplant on autistic kids. Mm -hmm. um, and the outcome of this transplant, not only these kids, you know, improved their GI symptoms because they were suffering some of GI issues, but they improved in their behavior. Um, and, and this improvement was sustained over time, even after weeks, and I should say months, of the transplant. Uh, now, does this mean that now we have a solution for all this? No. Not yet, but at least it tells us that targeting the composition of the microbiota in the gut is definitely a valuable possibility that may eventually have dividends yeah. once we understand a little bit more what's going on in there. Well, you know, it seems like it's a it's a really interesting thing, the, the whole fecal transplant question. And I remember the you know, long was that research about the, the the fat rat, skinny rat, right? Where they, That's where they right. you know, exchanged some of the uh, the flora from in, in each of them, and then they they swapped. You know, the one that was fat became skinny, and the one that was skinny became fat. And you know, it just it raises so many questions. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I, I really do believe that again. Uh, these are all proof of concept that seems, you know, that you know, changing your metabolism, uh, targeting specific genes, uh, in other words, affecting who you are can really have uh, the microbiome as a possible target. Yes, great. Well, you know what? Um, we, uh, Dr. Fazana uh, will be back with us after the break, um, unless you hang in there. 
Uh, we have more segments with him, and we're going to interweave some of your questions uh, the, the, because you asked in the next two because there's so many questions that came in. So don't go away. We're going to start asking some of your questions and, and hear more of uh, Dr. Fasano's wisdom after the break. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet at Amazon.com. Or visit yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. What does HealthyLife.net and Amazon.com have in common? Well, they're both available on the Internet. They both give great value. But most important, most of our positive program hosts and guests are accomplished authors. And their books are available from, you got it, Amazon.com. Now it even gets better than that. Because when you're listening on air to a HealthyLife.net host or guest, you can go directly to Amazon.com and you can order your book while you're still listening to your favorite HealthyLife.net program. So when you hear an author you like, go to the homepage of HealthyLife.net and click on Amazon.com. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. HealthyLife.net, the positive radio network. YumFoodForLiving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit YumFoodForLiving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, a blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit YumFoodForLiving.com. Yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. HealthyLife.net, the positive radio network. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show, where we celebrate everyday heroes and work together to help make the world a better place. Today we have a, a wonderful hero, and again, I, I think we're all everyday heroes because life is life is inherently hard, um, and some people who step step up and are able to um, have an even greater impact um, and so forth is like our guest today. Um, so if you are just joining us today, we are here talking gluten immunity and the gut with world-renowned celiac disease researcher, uh, pediatric gastroenterologist, and Harvard professor, Dr. Alessio Fazzano. And as I mentioned in the last segment, uh, normally we wait for the Because You Asked segment to the last segment, but uh, we're bumping it up. We're going to be, because there's so many questions that have come in um, to address that I want to be sure to get as many of those as we can in. Um, so we're going to start answering some of those questions right now. Um, and uh, But before we do, I, I wonder if you would be willing to speak just, just briefly. I, one of the most common um, symptoms as, as a psychologist in my work uh, that I see people struggle with is around depression, anxiety, and, and I have noticed uh, with a lot of people, once, and I always suggest that they get tested for celiac disease first, but once they um, rule out whether they do or don't uh, have celiac disease, um, when they stop eating gluten, um, particularly if I, I you know, talk about gluten, dairy, and sugar as are three of the big buggers, that a lot of times people who have depression, anxiety, um, uh, report back and, and really seem to have a change. Um, can, you, can you speak to what you know or what, what the research is showing right now around depression, anxiety, and, and you know, where gluten fits into the picture, if at all? Sure, and let me make a disclaimer before that I answer. Of course, you know, we're talking about conditions that they are extremely frequent and multifactorial. So exactly. I can list, uh, actually you, because you have the expertise more than I do, mm -hmm. you know, so many reasons why people can have anxiety or depression that we will spend the next couple of days just to go through the list. I know. <laughs> and, and, of course, you know, gluten can be yes. one of them. 
Yes. Biologically speaking, uh, there are a couple of uh, non mutually exclusive, uh, you know, explanation why this is happening. Um, you know, uh, they start with the same premises that we discussed this before. So you ingest gluten containing grains. Uh, gluten is only partially digested, and some of these fragments that are not digested eventually uh, will cross the intestinal barrier through a leaky gut. So these steps are common to this couple of uh, possible theories. Mm -hmm. Now, from here, <clears throat> there are you know uh, two different visions of the story. One that suggests that this fragment will go into <clears throat> the bloodstream and reach the brain through the blood brain barrier. And because they are structurally very similar to chemicals that control our behavior that we call endorphins, as a matter of fact, these are called gliodorphins, they can interact with the same targets that uh, endorphins they uh, go after. And on a specific genetic background, you can develop, you know, changing your behavior that, again, can go from, you know, something very mild uh, or, you know, like short memory loss to ADHD, autism, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, and so on and so forth. Um, an alternative theory, again, has the same first steps that are in common. So you ingest gluten-containing grains, they are partially digested, they sneak in through a leaky gut. And here, the new system sees the enemy and starts, you know, to fight. And as I mentioned before, some of these immune cells, you know, are programmed to leave the battlefield and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And this is the brain and creates a situation near inflammation. And depending where this near inflammation materializes, meaning who you are genetically, you can have these different outcomes. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Great. Yeah. And, and obviously, there's there's a multiplicity of, of causes for these things, but it's it's, a, it's always nice to rule out something you actually might have some control over. Um, and uh, yeah. So so, how about we shift to one of our um, questions? This is this is one that I, I have a lot of questions, but there's a few that I think we really need to hit upon. Uh, this is someone who wrote in and asked, "Can you tell me if celiacs can live a long, healthy life similar to those without celiac disease?" I have been recently diagnosed, and my son is in the process of being tested. Thank you. Absolutely. Actually, that's the normal destiny of an individual diagnosed with severe disease that will comply with the diet. Mm -hmm. um, unless there are complications that materialize, you know, in some, um, you know, very specific circumstances, an individual, you know, um, diagnosed with severe disease that comply with the gluten-free diet will have the symptoms that will resolve, the damage of the intestine that characterizes the autoimmune insult to see the disease resolved. The uh, disappearance of the outer antibodies are the biomarkers of the autoimmune process. So they will become totally and non distinguishable from people in the normal general population. And the other thing that we know as a fact is that while life expectancy, um, you know, um, in, uh, in uh, individuals with serious disease not treated is shorter, so in other words, there's increased risk of mortality. If you go on a gluten-free diet, life expectancy is exactly the same as the general population. Oh, that's fantastic to know. Well, you know, that, that leads me to another question that many people have asked. I'm just going to make up one because it's uh, that so many people have asked this question, is, you know, once you are diagnosed, now there's some people who have written that say that they've been diagnosed, and then, um, and then they're wondering how long it takes to uh, feel better, to to you know have the symptoms go away, how they you know for the gut to be not just the gut to be healed, but maybe some of the other um, implications. Maybe if there's been some uh, leaky gut that's gone into some of the other tissues and other organ systems, uh, and there's some people who even after years say that they still don't feel like they've they don't feel they still feel out of whack. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? And again, I know this is a this is a loaded question, and there was some recent research you guys have done around with children that uh, maybe you can share about too. That's right. So uh, again, unfortunately, we're talking about a target organ that is you know extremely l long. Um, in an adult, we talk about roughly 20 feet of intestine. And in kids, it's a little bit shorter, but still we're talking about a very large, you know, organ. So when we do the diagnosis, we look at the very first few inches of this long tube. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know what it, the rest of the intestine looks like. And it's intuitive that if you have a damage that is rather localized in a very small area, you will recover much faster compared to somebody that has the entire 20 feet of the intestine destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, of course, another variable that sometimes we don't control completely is, you know, compliance. I'm not saying 
you know, necessary people, they cheat on a diet. I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, once you know what the CV disease is all about mm -hmm. and you appreciate that, you know, the gluten-free diet is a therapeutic intervention, you stick with the program. But unfortunately, inadvertent exposure to gluten is not an exception, um, mm -hmm. particularly when you travel and uh, you are the mercy of people that may may not appreciate how strictly you have to be gluten-free. Mm -hmm. And that translates in the fact that even if you feel that you are really stick with the program, you still have exposure to minuscule amount of gluten that, parenthetically, would do the same damage than uh, compared to if you just eat, you know, unrestricted diet. So mm -hmm. even minuscule amount can really, you know, keep you uh, uh, off balance, so to speak, and keep the damage in the intestine there. And, you know, going to what you just mentioned, we just, you know, published, uh, and, uh, and I say very surprisingly, the fact that, you know, up to 20% of kids, they stick with the program, the diet. Mm -hmm. And even if the symptoms are gone, but even more so if the symptoms are still there, they still have a damage in the intestine, um, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, th th there is still, you know, the possibility that there is, you know, a continuous damage. And that fuels a, a, a total di different line of research, a new um, complementary treatment to the gluten-free diet around the pipeline, and some of them are reaching the phase three trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. So that twenty percent, and when you're doing that research, how 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 long after how? Um, oh, this is after a year on a gluten-free diet. So these okay. people should be already taken care of. Right, right. So not sure why. All right. Well. We got, we got one more segment, guys. We're going to have to um, uh, close this segment, but don't go away. We're going to be right back with Dr. Alessia Fazzano talking more and answering more of your questions about gluten immunity and the gut. Don't go away. Being inspired by a speaker while learning everyday positive information that you can use to help your life is exactly what Dr. Teresa Nicasio does when she speaks in front of your group. From healthcare professionals to special needs parenting and everything in between, Dr. Teresa Nicasio can customize topics for your group on everything from health to psychology. To book Dr. Teresa Nicasio as a speaker for your group, visit yumfoodforliving.com or call 604-445-6463. That's 604 604-445 Four four five six four six three. If you're like the 8 out of 10 women that say finding genes that fit is a problem, well, your problem is solved. Lee Genes has done extensive research, and they have genes that fit. There's even an online Lee Fit Finder, so you can find the right fit for you. Imagine jeans that instantly slim you with a custom fit and no gap waistband. And guys, kids, Lee has jeans for you, too. Click through to Lee's Jeans on the HealthyLife.net advertiser page and get what fits. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore a substitute ingredient so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book, Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! Plant-Based Recipes for a Gluten-Free Diet at Amazon.com or visit YumFoodForLiving.com. That's YumFoodForLiving.com. Radio your way. HealthyLife.net. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. For those of you who are just joining us, we are here with Dr. Alessio Fazzano, uh, the a wonderful gastroenterologist who is sharing information about gluten and immunity and the gut. And we're answering some of your questions 
Um, and so I, I'm going to jump to another question right away, Alessio, it, that keeps coming up in different ways. I'll just, I'll just pick one, one of the questions that came in. I have heard stories about friends of friends of mine who say they are gluten intolerant, but they can go to Italy and eat lots of pasta with no bad symptoms. Sounds to me like an allergy or something in North America. Comments? Uh, we don't know for sure. Actually, you know, I'm aware about this kind of, um, um, you know, experience that many individuals uh, of our patients, they have when they go to Europe and seems to tolerate much better the grains there compared to here. Now, again, um, if this is diff- due to different cultivars, i.e. different strains of wheat that they have there, or, you know, the um, the use of pesticides and uh, how much are allowed and how much are not. Um, that, that I'm not sure that we have solid data, but definitely there is something there that seems to, you know, at least ameliorate, you know, the um, outcome when you're exposed to gluten compared to uh, what happened here in North, North America. Mm-hmm. And, and when people talk about using fermented grains instead, uh, fermented gluten grains, and say, well, then it's, then it's safe for someone with celiac disease to eat, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, again, um, because uh, as we were mentioning that, uh, you know, uh, gluten toxicity is related to these undigestible, you know, um, fragments that we cannot digest, but some bacteria, they can. Mm-hmm. You know, fermented grains, if they are digested by the process of fermentation in um causing a decrease in the load of these toxic fragments, at least on paper, seems to be a logical possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but again, I don't think that we have, you know, clear explanation and data yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so lots of great questions, man. It seems like the whole uh, microbiome, the, the uh, like you said, the probiotics, prebiotics, all that, uh, that good stuff, it's... Uh, it's, it's just a growing field. Um, well, again, uh, as I was telling you before, it is, and we are the virtue to capitalize on that if we do our own work. As a matter of fact, we've been entrusted by the uh, National Institute of Health here in the United States uh, to conduct a prospective study on a birth course of infants at risk for celiac disease that mm-hmm. we call CDGEM, that stands for Celiac Disease Genome Environmental Microbiome and mm-hmm. Metabolomic Studies. Mm-hmm. So this mouthful of... Uh, <laughs> it means that what we're trying to do is really to study who you are, genetically speaking, what kind of neighborings, you know, co-evolve with you, i.e. the microbiome, and how this crosstalk may eventually lead to stay healthy or lose tolerance and develop the problem. So if we do it our own work and establish if and when we take the wrong turn and develop seeded disease and link this to a specific microbiome composition, once again, we may find mm-hmm. a target. And, and that's the reason why we're very excited about this project that uh, hopefully will give dividends, not just for severe disease, but many other conditions for which many variables, particularly the culprits that makes you sick, are not known. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, this is, we're talking about a whole other iceberg here because because uh, uh, when we think about autoimmune, you know, uh, immune problems select like disease, and how many more, we're seeing so many more other autoimmune uh, disorders, the MS, uh, we're seeing, the, you know, the diabetes, the the um, lupus, and all that. And and uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts about that? And and uh, with the research that you're going to be doing, what there might be the implications, but also the, the thought that that uh, or the recommendation that's been going around for those anyone with. Who, who knows that they have or suspects they have an autoimmune condition, uh, to even if they're not celiac, uh, that they uh, avoid gluten. What are, your, what are your thoughts about that? So, first of all, I believe that this CDGEM study would give dividends to many other autoimmune diseases. And the reason why is that in Western countries, as you were mentioned before, we're really literally um, witnessing uh, this epidemics of autoimmune diseases, asthma, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, see the disease, type 1 diabetes. And again, the timeline of these epidemics is way too short to blame genetic mutation to be responsible. Mm-hmm. It's really that we're changing our environment too fast for us to adapt as human beings. Mm-hmm. And among the stuff that we're changing, you know, no matter if you talk about use and abuse of uh, antibiotics or the number of infections that we face or, you know, the use of pesticides or, you know, most important, probably the most important factor, the way that we eat, they all, as a bottleneck, they impinge on the microbiome composition. 
Mm-hmm. And therefore, you know, I'm pretty sure that if we're going to get, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel with this study to figure out which composition it really touch the cords that put you at risk to develop disease, and what are the environmental factors that make this composition to go the wrong directions, then we will have, you know, um, the holy grail of primary prevention or at least stratification of population for personalized intervention. Yeah. Speaking of which, of course, you know, we know that 100% of the people with severe disease of gluten sensitivity would benefit the gluten-free diet. Mm-hmm. If other autoimmune diseases, or, you know, um, you know, uh, multiple sclerosis would benefit the gluten-free diet is a matter of, you know, uh, major debates. Mm-hmm. There are some animal models, evidence, suggests that at least in type 1 diabetes, the gluten-free diet can be beneficial. Mm-hmm. So my sense is that, you know, while 100% of the people with severe disease benefit, maybe there is a subgroup of people with type 1 diabetes or MS that can benefit the diet. The, the mm-hmm. challenge now is to identify who are these people so that we can implement this intervention. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a really empowering and exciting um, uh, plan. And just real quickly, I know we've done a lot more time. Uh, uh, Alessia, can you just talk a little bit about your book, uh, Gluten Freedom, because that's, that's, a, that's a really wonderful book. And so yeah, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, many of the concepts that we discussed during the show are really expanded and, and in deep details in this book. Uh, this book uh, that, you know, we wrote, I worked together with Susie Flaherty, it, it's just, uh, um, you know, had the goal to really be factual, to you know, make the record straight in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what is the fact of what is fantasy in terms of gluten and who should go on a gluten-free diet, what are the impacts of the immune system, and so on and so forth. So again, if you're curious and you want to expand a little bit more what you heard during the show, I think that the book is not only factual but down to hers is it's uh, you know for the general readership and not for only you know professionals. So right. you know this is something that you can grasp. Right. And and, and the and the proceeds of the book uh, go they go to your research, right? Or was, that's right. 100 percent. No, neither Susie nor I will put anything in the pocket. They all go back to research so that we can have the chance to be invited in shows like this and share our exciting research. Yeah, no, it's really, I, I can't tell you what it's meant, and for someone myself who, um, you know, who has suffered, and, and uh, I, I can't tell you how much it means to me that you are, have put your life and, you know, your vision of, of doing, of, of helping people in, in the way that you have, and, and, uh, and it comes through in, in your work, it comes through in your book, and um, and I want to thank you for, for coming on the show today, Alessio. Is there any last words of wisdom or a takeaway you want to give our listeners before we finish up? Well, again, uh, I want just to, first of all, thank you for inviting me on um, the show and, and brainstorm with you about, you know, our line of research. And uh, I have to say, again, that, uh, you know, um, I don't think that we have to portray the gluten as the enemy that needs to be fought so that uh, we can survive as a human being. But at the same time, you know, some word of wisdom is that, you know, there are people besides celiac and gluten disease that may benefit on a gluten-free diet. And we'll see. We'll see how it is. All right. All right. Well, thank you all for, for joining us today. Bye. Um, I'm Teresa, and this has been the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. Thank you, Dr. Alessio Fazano, for joining us. And I hope you all have a great week. Talk to you soon.